OK, today we will cover the 2020-2021 Space Systems Reset Exam paper. I shall be covering the topics on orbit maneuvers, ADCS, propulsion and launch systems. The other topics in this exam paper will be covered by the other GTAs. So the first of the questions is question 10, which is a topic relating to orbital maneuvers. We wish to bring a state geostationary spacecraft down from its 42,164 radius circular orbit to a 100 kilometer altitude circular low Earth orbit using a Hohmann transfer. And we need to calculate the eccentricity of the transfer orbit and the total velocity change. OK, so the first thing you need to notice about this question is that we've got inconsistencies. One figure has been given as a radius that is including the radius of Earth and the other has been given as an altitude. So in order to keep these consistent, we must add the radius of Earth to the second figure, the 100 kilometers, given a value of 6,471. As you can see, the radius of Earth has been given to you in the question. OK, so we are going to need an elliptical transfer orbit here. The apogee of this elliptical transfer orbit is of course going to be the the radius of the geostationary orbit so the radius of apogee will be 42,164 and correspondingly the perigee of this orbit will also be the 6,471 kilometers of the leo so so from, the, from those figures, we can quite clearly ca calculate the value of eccentricity. There are a couple of ways um, algebraically you can do this. One is to use the equation E equals RA minus RP divided by RA plus RP. Or you can calculate the semi-major axis and calculate it that way. So in this example, As you can see, Kira here has calculated it using the semi-major axis. And if you follow the algebra through, you'll get a value of 0.734, which if you think about it, is quite logical, considering we have quite a highly elliptical orbit here. Now, the next step is to calculate the total required velocity change. Now, as you've done many, many times by now, uh, you're going to need a series of two burns. The first burn is going to be a burn at the apogee of the elliptical transfer orbit. So from this, we will need to calculate the velocity of the circular geostationary orbit and the velocity of apogee of the elliptical transfer orbit. And one very, very important thing to point out here is that because the um, we are burning at the apogee rather than at the perigee, as most Hohmann transfer examples are done. We will actually end up with a negative delta V for this. That is, the velocity of ap at the apogee of the transfer orbit is actually less than the velocity of the circular geostationary orbit. And if you use the equation V equals the square root of mu multiplied by two over the radius. In this case, the radius would be the radius of the apogee minus one over the semi-major axis. You'll see that the, the velocity at the apogee is a value of 1.586 kilometers per second. And then if you use the traditional V equals the square root of mu over A, which in this case will be mu over r because we're dealing with a circular orbit, uh, the value will be 3.075 kilometers per second. And then from there, we can simply subtract the two values and we can calculate that the value for the first orbit, first change in orbit, sorry, is 1.489 kilometers per second. It doesn't matter too much whether you define it as a positive or a negative. 
but technically it is a negative value because we are decreasing the altitude rather than increasing it. And then you repeat the same process for the second bin, except this time instead of calculating the velocity at the apogee, you'll be calculating the velocity at the perigee. So you simply use the same equation, but instead of the, you instead of doing two mu over the radius of the apogee, you do two mu over the radius of the perigee. And naturally, this will give you quite a larger figure. And once you do that, you will find you have an answer of 10.33 kilometers per second. And then this time, if you calculate the velocity of the circular Leo orbit, that is the 100 kilometer orbit, you will get an answer of 7 point, around 7.85, which is about, right, it's about right for a very low Earth orbit satellite. And again, if you subtract these like you did in the previous example, you will end up with a value of 2.486 kilometers per second. Again, a negative value. You must make sure that we don't accidentally, um, you must take the magnitude of these figures, otherwise you will end up with a total delta V that is much smaller than, than it is in reality, which is why I personally like to always treat them as positive values to, to ensure that we aren't adding and subtracting positive and negative values. And if you do that correctly, you will end up with a value of just under four kilometers per second, 3,975. And as you can see in this mark scheme, you would have been given full marks whether you quoted it as a positive or a negative value. And that is the first question, and you would have been given eight marks if you had done all that. Now, question 11. A spacecraft has been deployed from the ISS into a circular orbit with an altitude h of 400 kilometers and an inclination i of 51 degrees. Calculate the delta v required in kilometers per second. Do a single burn transfer to a new eccentric orbit inclined at 60 degrees with an apogee altitude of 500 kilometers and a perigee altitude of 400 kilometers. OK, so the key point here to note is that it is a single burn. This is very much like the final tutorial of the GMAT session you did earlier in the semester at the end of uh, the 2022 year. So you use the cosine rule here. But first, before we use the cosine rule, we must calculate both the circular orbit, the velocity of the circular orbit, that is the 400 kilometer altitude circular orbit, and the velocity of the perigee of the transfer orbit. So to calculate that, we would first use uh, uh, square root of mu divided by 400 plus re. If I just bring up the answer sheet, you can go through this. You would get an answer of 7.673. And then as shown here, you'd have to first of all work out the um, the semi-major axis by taking the average of the radius of perigee and the radius of apogee found by simply adding the value of RE to both the altitude of, of perigee and the altitude of apogee. And then if you repeat, like we did in the previous question, if you use another example cal to calculate the velocity at the perigee of the transfer orbit, you will get an answer slightly higher, 7.701 kilometers per second, which isn't surprising because the distance, the variation between the perigee and the apogee is actually quite small. It's only 100 kilometers altitude difference between them. Now, unlike the normal examples, you would normally, normal Hohmann transfers, you would normally subtract these two. But instead, we are going to add this into the following equation. This, you'll remember from A level, is your cosine rule. And we are told in the question that we want to go from a 51 degree inclination orbit to a 60 degree inclination orbit. So we can put in delta V is equal to the square root of the square of the circular 
velocity, that is the 7.673 kilometers per second, plus the square of the perigee transfer orbit, that is the 7.701, minus two times the, the product of the two velocities multiplied by cos of theta. Theta in this case is not the overall angle, it is the change in angle. So that is 60 minus 51, giving you a value of nine degrees. And if you plug those numbers in, you'll get a value of 1.206 kilometers per second, which is maybe a bit lower than you would have expected, which helps to explain why we like to do these combined plane change maneuvers rather than doing Hohmann transfers and an inclination change separately. So that is the end of the entire section on orbit maneuvers. So we will now move on to a series of questions on propulsion and launch vehicles. This is question 12 in your recent exam. A two-stage launcher is considered for a particular mission to launch a 500 kilogram satellite to a LEO orbit with an alpha altitude of approximately 500 kilometers. The first stage of the launcher has a structural mass of 6250 kilograms and a fuel mass of 62,500 kilograms. And the second stage of the launcher has a structural mass of 250 kilograms and a fuel mass of two and a half thousand kilograms. And both stages use an identical performance thruster, both having an ISP of 300 seconds. Okay. So the first thing we need to do here is to total up, tally up the, the total mass. That is M0, that is your takeoff mass. So that is the sum of the 500 kilogram satellite, the 6250 structural mass of the first stage, the 62,500 of this fuel, and the entire total of the second stage. And if you do that, you should find that we get a figure of 72,000 kilograms. It's worth noting here that the vast majority of the total mass is actually that of the first stage fuel, which is quite an important fact that I'll come back to later. Now, we now need to calculate the, the mass at the end of the first stage burn. Now we assume for this that the entire mass of the fuel, that is the 62,500 kilograms, has been used up. In practice, this is of course never true, but we make this assumption. And by doing that, you will get a value of nine and a half thousand kilograms. And with that, you can then use the rocket equation Delta V is equal to the specific impulse, that is 300 seconds, multiplied by G on the surface of Earth, that is 9.81, and then multiplied by the natural logarithm of the 72,000 initial mass divided by the 9,500 uh, final mass. And I'm just going to skip ahead a little bit here. And if you do that, you should find that you get a value of 5.96 kilometers per second. Now, the same stage, as you can see in the mark scheme, is repeated for the second uh, stage of the launch vehicle. So for this, we assume that all of the structural mass of the first stage has been jettisoned, that is the 6250 kilograms. So you would subtract that and you'd get a value for M3 of 3250 kilograms. And we perform the same analysis as we performed in the first stage. That is, we subtract the entire fuel mass of the second stage, that is two and a half thousand. And that leaves us with a final mass that is just the payload of the, the, the satellite. That is the satellites, I'm sorry. And also there's the structural mass of the second stage, which together gives you a value of 750. And again, we input that into the, the rocket equation, again, using 300 multiplied by G times a natural logarithm of 3 to 50 divided by 750. And if you calculate that, you'll get a value of 4.32 kilometers per second. 
And then for our total delta B, you simply sum those two answers and you'll get a value of 10.28 kilometers per second. Now, it's worth noting that this is quite logical because you are looking just to achieve orbit, you would need a velocity of around eight kilometers per second, ignoring any losses. Now, in practice, you will have losses due to drag, due to gravitational losses, and also due to inclination changes and so on. So you will always need a value that is much higher than eight, or at least somewhat higher than eight. Now, moving on to question 13, this is another question dedicated to launch vehicles. You wish to launch a spacecraft directly into an orbit at an altitude of 600 kilometers with an inclination of 30 degrees from the new UK launch site in the Shetland Islands, which has a latitude of 60 degrees north. How many launch windows per orbit will you have? Now, in this case, We have zero launch windows. This is because the altitude, the latitude, I'm sorry, of the launch site is greater in magnitude than the inclination of the satellite. We can only ever launch into a higher inclination than the latitude at which we are launching from. So therefore, there are no launch windows per orbit for this. This is quite a straightforward three mark question. Now, I'm just going to skip ahead of these sections because this will be covered by Sahil in your final revision session. And I'm just going to go to questions 19 and 20, which are based on attitude control. Now, again, we have a qualitative question here to start off with. Which of the following is not an example of attitude control hardware? Now, the answer here is going to be gyroscopes and the main the main reason is that gyroscopes is a determination tool, not a control tool. And by that, I mean that gyroscopes help you know where you are, but they don't actually let you change where you're pointing. Whilst thrusters, magnet talkers, momentum wheels and reaction wheels can allow you to actually change the orientation, that is the attitude of your satellite. Now, moving on to question 20, that is the Final question of this exam paper. A small cubic satellite in a very low equatorial orbit with an altitude of 250 kilometers has a mass moment of inertia in all three axes of 50 kilograms square meter and has a total volume of one cubic meter. And the satellite has a slew requirement of 45 degrees in 30 seconds. OK. So the first thing here is we are going to assume that it is a constant acceleration maneuver. And by that, we are going to assume we are going to calculate a 45 degree uh, slew in 30 seconds. So simply calculating that for that is 45 degrees over 30 seconds, although we would like to calculate this into in radians. And if you do that, you should get an answer of 0.03 radians per second. So pi divided by 180 multiplied by 45 divided by 30 seconds. That is quite a straightforward one, and I shall move on. And again, as mentioned in the question, we want to perform the 45 degree maneuver in 30 seconds, but we are going to assume that half the distance is maneuvered in half the time. That is, our time is not 30 seconds, but it's instead 15 seconds. And then, as I mentioned, we are assuming that our angular, our velocity is, our acceleration is constant. Therefore, we can again divide the angular velocity calculated originally, the 0.03, 
and divide that by the 15 seconds that we have to perform a maneuver. And if we do that, we know we have a value of 0 0.002 radians per second squared. And then to calculate the torque required, we simply multiply the 0 0.002 radians per second by the 50 uh, kilograms per meter squared of the moment of inertia. And if we calculate this, we get a value of 0 0.0873 newton meters. And that is the end of this exam paper.